Hello again, everybody, and welcome to my channel. It's all about the history of spirituality and various religions. So if you like these topics, please check out my playlists, and I invite you to subscribe. I have a question for you today, and uh, in the comments, you might want to answer it with uh, some of the um, groups that you've come across that you'd like to know what they're all about. Uh, my question is, have you ever been listening or reading and come across one of those names that apply to, well, they apply to some kind of group or movement. You can tell that much, but you have no idea who they are or what they believe. I do that. In my research, uh, I'll be researching about one topic and uh, I'll suddenly come across one of those words and I, I don't have a clue who they are or what it means. So on this channel, I've been trying to introduce some of those groups to you in short videos that summarize their main point. And this is one of those videos. I'm going to talk about uh, Pelagianism. Now, that's not to be confused with plagiarism. A plagiarism means copying somebody else's words or work or research and claiming it as your own. Pelagianism is a Christian theological movement that was uh, declared by those who won the battle for orthodoxy to be an error. It's based on the teachings of a man named Pelagius, whose years were 355 to 4, 420 AD. A man probably from the British Isles who moved to Rome in the uh, year 380. He was a lay person, neither a priest nor a bishop in the church, but he lived at a time when the church had received the stamp of approval from the Roman Emperor Constantine and had become a recognized state religion. So persecution had ceased and life for the Christian people it was on the upswing. People were now born into the religion instead of converting. They were Christian because they were Roman. But like many other state religions, the participants ceased to have the enthusiasm of converts. They became lax in adhering to the doctrines. Church leaders themselves often failed to demonstrate what Pelagius believed to be true core Christian values. Well, seeing the condition of the church, he proposed a number of things. He promoted higher moral standards, and he taught that it was possible to live a sinless life. He believed that the good God would never demand of people things that they were unable to accomplish. Uh, if God commanded it, then we were capable of performing it. And although he considered Jesus to be redeemer of humanity, he didn't emphasize this, but instead he saw Jesus primarily as exemplar of how to live a sinless Christian life. A perfect human was very rare, but it had been accomplished by a few of the great prophets. The Orthodox version, of course, is that uh, Jesus was the only one who ever lived without sin. Sin is a matter of choice, he said. People are born with a free will and a conscience and can, using reason, 
tell the difference between right and wrong, and can choose to do right. He also taught that humans are free from the burden of original sin because it would be unjust of God to uh, blame one person for the sin of another. Original sin, which was taught by the Orthodox, was the uh, doctrine that humans are born in sin. All humanity is considered guilty of the sin of Adam, the sin that he committed in the Garden of Eden. In Pelagius' view, the doctrine of original sin placed too little emphasis on our human capacity for self-improvement and encouraged people instead to just rely on forgiveness and to relax their Christian practice. Pelagius believed that Adam's sin had caused humans to become mortal and had given them a bad example, but had not corrupted their nature. He taught that humans could overcome the fear of death by living good, devout lives, and they could see death as a release from toil instead of as a punishment. And he also believed that giving people a strong teaching about free will was the best motivation for individuals to reform their conduct they would come to realize that they were absolutely free to act and on the other side of the coin would therefore be responsible for their actions. Living in the bad habit of sinning was what corrupted the human, not the fall of Adam. All Christians could strive to lead a sinless life. A human's ability to act correctly is the gift of God. Other gifts included divine revelation and the teachings of Jesus, but it wasn't enough to settle for keeping the commandments. A person should also do good works and cultivate the virtues. Since a person would only be judged for personal sins and not those of Adam, infants are without fault and unbaptized infants would not be sent to hell as some people believed. He rejected that infant baptism forgave original sin. But he did believe it was good, a good thing to baptize infants to bring them into a close union with Christ. He also believed that infants who died in an unbaptized state went to purgatory. Now, baptism for adults was essential because adults had committed sin. So it was essential for the forgiveness of personal sin. After an adult died, they would be judged by their acts and their omissions, and they'd be cons uh, consigned to everlasting fire, that is hell, not for the evils that they had done, but for the good things that they had failed to do. So he never did accept purgatory as a destination for adults. Now, although he taught that this path of righteousness was available for every person, the, the path was open to them. In fact, very few would ever manage to follow it and be saved. He taught it was probably necessary to 
instill the fear of hell into people to convince them to follow their religion if um, internal motivation wasn't enough. So at a deeper theological level, his teaching that a man could choose between good and evil without divine intervention, that brought into question Christianity's core doctrine of Jesus' act of substitutionary atonement to expiate the sins of men, sometimes called a sacrificial death or substitutionary death. Jesus died for the sins of mankind. And for this reason, um, Pelagianism became associated with non-Trinitarian interpretations of Christianity, those that rejected the divinity of Jesus. An important difference between Christianity and Judaism is that Christianity teaches justification by faith, and Judaism that man can make the choice to follow God's laws. This made uh, Pelagianism closer to Jewish belief uh, that had been rejected by Christians ever since the writings of St. Paul. Pelagius encouraged people to read the Hebrew scriptures and especially the law. This made him unpopular with theologians of his day when they labeled him as a Judaizer. After Pelagius was declared a heretic, and just before his death, he was excommunicated by Pope Innocent. He did have considerable support among Christians during his lifetime, especially those Christians who had not yet heard of St. Augustine's teaching about original sin. St. Augustine was his strongest critic while Pelagius lived. Augustine called him the enemy of the grace of God. Now, according to scholar Ali Bonner, the crusade against Pelagianism and the other heresies narrowed the range of acceptable opinions and reduced the intellectual freedom of classical Rome. Now time changes things, and over time, some believe that those authors who are considered the predecessors of modern liberalism, that they had Pelagian views about evil. And in the 20th century, Pelagius and his teachings were reconsidered. Here's a quote. If a heretic is one who emphasizes one truth to the exclusion of others, it would appear that Pelagius was no more a heretic than Augustine. His fault was in exaggerated emphasis. Uh, that's a quote from John Ferguson in 1956. Well, as we have studied many of these movements and groups together in these videos, I'd have to agree that often the differences between the groups was a matter of emphasis. As I look at the various religions and denominations within, uh, within them today, I believe the trend continues in the movements of the modern world of spirituality. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video and found it informative. If you did, please accept my standing invitation to like, subscribe, and comment. 
I'd love to hear from you about any of these subjects. I find the comments very informative. Often, people closer to a movement or from the country of origin give me important local information and it's a great help to me sometimes. So thank you so much for watching and contributing. Uh, join with me again soon. Bye for now.